fourth reading room off of the east reading room, and we're looking at the portrait of Joseph Addison, the early, late 17th century, early 18th century author and government servant in Britain. Um, Addison wasn't the first person to have a, to write for periodicals, but um, he was probably the most important, the most prolific, um, and did the best writing considered by uh, literary historians. Um, this picture was done by Sir Godfrey Neller, and it's in the style of the prince of a uh, one category of prints that he did for the um, Kit Kat Club, uh, a group that he belonged to that was half political, half literary, um, in England at the time. Um, it's supposed to be School of Neller because it's not known elsewhere. But um, because this was this came to the library in the early 1930s when art values were, you could say, volatile, um, this could be by Miller. We just don't know. It would take more research to figure that out. But this, but the pose is typical of one kind of Kit Kat Club portrait. He's also known for another Neller portrait of Joseph Addison that's in the National Portrait Gallery in London that isn't nearly as interesting. So now we're starting a third category of, of, of major art, several pieces of a type. And this one is a, um, a plan of the landscape for Villa Turica. It was created in part by the Foundation for Architecture and Landscape Architecture in, in a period from 1926 until 1931. The last summer of the program, 1931, was held in the new library building, actually. And as a result, a lot of, of their uh, material stayed here. They didn't know there wasn't going to be a program in 1932, or 33, or 34, or 35. By 1935, um, with David Adler, the architect as president, or president, I believe, they sadly announced that they were their training for bringing architects and landscape architects together to collaborate on projects probably wasn't going to be needed, certainly for large residences, for a while, and that the current architects could handle the load. So they closed the program in 1935 completely. The, interestingly, though, the, the, the prize that they were all coming for in kind of a cold and bold czar spirit of contests, um, that prize still continues. It's given, it's been transferred, the endowment for that from Edward L. Ryerson was transferred to the University of Illinois landscape program in, um, in Urbana-Champaign, and it's still given. There's an annual prize given there. Uh, probably it's a traveling prize, but it was meant for a year abroad. Um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the prize had one, the, the, the whole program had one limitation. The first year it was co-ed, and a man won the um, architecture prize, and a woman won the, the, the landscape architecture prize. This would have been like 1926. Um, the, the trustees didn't know what to do. They couldn't send off to travel alone together in Europe, unchaperoned, a man and a woman. So they decided to solve the problem by eliminating women from the program. Um, <laughs> so this was kind of a unique feature of the program, which makes it less interesting than if they had figured out a way to do it um, with making it co-ed. But that was one of the limitations. After the first year, you don't see work by women. Um, I'm looking here at one of the prints from that period of around 1930. Um, of Villa Turca. This was a 200-acre estate between between the south 1857 border of Lake Forest and the 1887 north border of Fort Sheridan. Uh, this was property of Hale McCormick and Edith Rockefeller McCormick. Now, Edith Rockefeller McCormick was very much interested in the Italian uh, the Italian arts. She was she's an aristocrat general, 
Um, she was John D. Rockefeller's oldest daughter, and um, she was she built this place between about 1909 and 1912. Uh, she the development sort of slowed down at that point. She had a house in the city, and so she only really came out here for daytime things. And one of the ex reasons for that is they say that during the, the World War I period, uh, be, leading up to and, and during World War I, there was gunnery practice starting at 5 o'clock in the morning at Fort Sheridan to the south. So she would come out for garden days and things like that, but she wasn't staying overnight. Maybe stayed one night and found out that they did gunnery practice. But it's a very nice plan. Uh, the house is looking toward the lake on that side. And this is a long access south to a tea house. The tea house still exists. The house has been gone since the 60s. Um, a little bit of the garden and certainly of the um, uh, cavalcade, and I'm, that's not the right word, uh, water, a series of waterfalls down the bluff. Uh, I'm not thinking of the right word, is, um, was in this plane. And that's, that's not part of what's um, in Lake Forest, is South Circle Lane. This is the plan for the House of the Four Winds by Harvard North Shaw. And Shaw and Edith and uh, Rose Standish Nichols both worked on the Iberal Moorish uh, gardens that are uh, north east of the house uh, and shown here. But this, in addition to the plan, there is a section at the bottom of the print which shows how the, the water flowed downhill from the house toward the northwest. And it went, it went like in at the Alhambra, in, or the Generalife above the Alhambra in Granada. It, it, the water flowed, it was in the um, Muslim tradition of um, prizing water and oases, and this in summer is definitely such a, such a drawing. So this fascinated all kinds of um, visitors, always has, it's been restored in the, around 2000. The, the plan was restored around 1980 uh, by the Lake Forest Garden Club, as it were all of these. But the garden itself um, was restored in uh, around 2001 by Craig Bergman for the former owners, the Redfields. Stand and, and this room has six prominent um, large prints by Joseph Pinnell, early 20th century artist, um, and they are all of Greeks, uh, Greek and Roman ruins subject. <coughs> and so they they fit the context of this room, which again is one of those. Uh, it's like the this is the west. I'm sorry, this is the east. <laughs> This is the East Reading Room. Uh, we were in the West Reading Room before with the Ottoman prints. Uh, these aren't nearly as, as significant as the Ottoman prints were, but uh, the room is very good, and this carries the theme of Guam um, very well also, and so it's an important part of the fabric of the, of the library historically. This is the East Fireplace. We've seen the West Fireplace and the North Fireplace, and this is the East Fireplace. Uh, it's a Georgian um, split um, broken pediments, and in the, the head this time is of the poet John Greenleaf Whittier. Whittier was an uh, important poet, wrote No Bound, which is a book-length poem, but was also really an important abolitionist, uh, worked at, at, uh, publications and did poetry about the abolition of slavery in the 1840s and 50s. So uh, interesting that he's included here. He was a much revered, uh, in the early 20th century, he was a much revered um, writer. By uh, Ulrich Langenegger, who was the, um, the artist that, that Alfred Hamler chose to do this work. 